Glory to Jesus Christ. So today is Tuesday, November 24th, 2020, uh, the Feast of the Martyrs of Vietnam. And today we're in our Bible study on 2 Timothy. So let's pray our prayer to the Holy Spirit first. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer from Devotions of the Holy Spirit by Father Brian Moore, S.J. from Pauline Books and Media. Page 40, 44 for charity. Holy Spirit, love zone fire, fill our hearts with love of God and neighbor. Without that twofold love, we cannot be pleasing to you. Without it, no other gift avails. Give us a love that is patient, kind, never jealous, boastful, or conceited. A love that does not seek its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice at injury done to another. It delights in the truth. Give us a love which bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Give us faith and hope. But above all and in all, give us love. Today, November 24th, is the Feast of the Martyrs of Vietnam, of St. Andrew Dung Lac, Priest and Companions Martyrs. St. Andrew, who lived from 1795 to 1839, was one of 117 of canonized saints, who, of whom eight were bishops and 50 priests and the rest uh, lay people, a number of them uh, Dominican Third Order members, who were martyred over the course of a few years in Vietnam. Although the martyrdom from the, uh, actually the 17th century, uh, on and off, but especially in the 19th century, numbered the thousands, and, and one was the guy that there were two, something like 150,000 Vietnamese Catholics who were killed either directly or indirectly uh, because of their faith uh, in the 19th and 18th and 19th century. And up to fairly late in the 19th century until the uh, takeover by the French, for which the French, uh, the persecution of the Catholics, and in particular the killing of, of French citizens they took as an excuse to colonize uh, Vietnam, uh, but much to the tormented history of the, that nation and people. In fact, like all of Indochina, they took Cambodia and Laos also. O God, source and origin of all fatherhood, who kept the martyrs St. Andrew Dung Lac and his companions, faithful to the cross of your Son, even to the shedding of their blood, grant through their intercession that spreading your love among our brothers and sisters, we may be your children both in name and in truth, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
So we left off at on a, I believe fourteen, Second Timothy fourteen, instructions concerning false teaching. Warning against useless disputes. This is if you're following along uh, with the New American Bible, the St. Joseph edition. It's on page 330, but whatever uh, version or edition you have, it is 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. Remind people of those things and charge them before God to stop disputing about words. This serves no useful purpose, since it harms those who listen. Be eager to present yourself as acceptable to God, a workman who causes no disgrace, imparting the word of truth without deviation. <coughs> and it, it's interesting that he uses the word remind, that this they people have been taught this, the Christian people have been taught this. And it's so much of what we've been taught, we need to be reminded. And it's sad when you see people uh, at confirmation at, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, think that they have learned anything, everything that they could possibly learn about the faith uh, and, and that it's boring, rather than that the fullness of the Christian faith, especially in the, in the, in the Christian fullness of it, of the Catholic fullness of it, it is so exciting. And I was really blessed with the, with the family that I had, the upbringing that I had, that uh, the faith was so central and that God is love was really uh, prominent in the faith. Not so much a God who is uh, angry, or, or out of control, not that. Although we were always taught that God is just and God sees everything and a sin is not acceptable to God. That's just not acceptable. We, we had this picture of the sacred heart that my parents brought over from Ireland, the, a version that's very common in Ireland. And, uh, and I, I'm told it was the first thing that was hung up, put in the house. They came right up, put a nail at it over the kitchen sink, and there to preside over the over the kitchen. And of course, my mother spent a good deal of time at the sink, uh, there at, 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 in, in prayer. And I, I remember my mother standing with her arms crossed, talking to God, and she didn't always look very, very pleased with God. I have to admit, with with or with things going on. With that. But uh, that, uh, as a child, I was certain that the eyes of that picture followed me around <laughs> when, when I, I would go, if I had something uh, that I had done or something I hadn't done uh, that was uh, not in uh, fulfillment of the Lord's commandments or whatever, if I had uh, disobeyed my parents or not done a chore I was supposed to do or or wasn't uh, uh, the kindest response to my other siblings, uh, my older siblings in particular, that, uh, so if I felt that the picture followed me. But I reminded, I was always, you know, it was, I, I was taught, and as much by an example as by anything else, uh, and the importance of the faith, and one of the things that uh, really struck me as a child was on the wall, we had pictures of relatives and we had the, in the dining room, we had a picture of uh, two pictures, two country scenes uh, that were uh, prints of paintings that sort of uh, a uh, 18th century English style country painting sort of thing. Uh, of these prints up there. But we also had there pictures of relatives. My Uncle Jimmy, his ordination picture in, in Argentina, of all sorts of things. 
And we had a, a, a little statue of Our Lady of Lords there. We had a, a, a picture of this, that, and the other thing. And in my uh, uh, parents' room, there was a, Our Lady of the Perpetual Health, St. Teresa picture, and pictures of relatives. And they were all sort of mixed together. And even as a young child, it, it, it struck me that we're all part of one family, what St. Paul called the mystical body of Christ, what the, the Apostles' Creed calls the communion of saints, that we're all connected, we're all, and they were a very real presence to me. The, the saints, and uh, especially Mary, as my mother, we used to have the rosary on the radio with Cardinal Cushing, and the, and especially Jesus. Jesus was just the center of everything. And to be reminded of that. And I'm so grateful I went through Catholic school at a period when uh, catechesis was, well, it was memorization of, of, the, of the Baltimore Catechism, but also with explanation that and it was very strong and very real and, and doctrine was taught right from the beginning. It wasn't just God is love, go draw a flower. It, it, there, was, there was substance to it right from the beginning. And uh, it pervaded all of the education that we had. It, it, and, uh, and the culture, my neighborhood culture, it was the uh, Catholic Christianity was very much a part of it. Everybody was Catholic, almost everybody was of uh, Irish background, Southern Irish background, uh, uh, Italian background, uh, French Canadian background on our street. And uh, there were a few people and there were adults who were, who weren't Catholics. And uh, that was fine. That was good. And, uh, and I remember as a child, everybody, just about everybody went to church. And if you didn't go to church, you didn't tell anybody. You know, on Sunday mornings, uh, mobs of people walking up the hill to St. Catherine's or, or to the, uh, to the, uh, the Baptist church up the street or to the Congregational Church on Highland Ave or, to, uh, the, or down the other way going down towards Davis Square to the many churches of the different denominations down there. Uh, it, you know, if it was uh, Sunday morning, there was a lot of traffic, especially foot traffic. And uh, of that, because that was Christendom there, which we don't have anymore. To I was just a great, a great loss, a great uh, loss. But uh, but since it dissipated so much, it showed that what was passed down was superficial. There wasn't this uh, sense of commitment in this personal reality of Christ, of the saints, of the Church throughout the world of a personal responsibility in all of this, and uh, that it didn't get into the heart. So that's really our vocation of every Christian, especially every Catholic Christian, to inculcate this, and especially by living. When people see what's going on in your life, of the, the, the faith, of what the faith does for you, even if your faith is rickety, that how the Lord carries you through this, that's the, the a belief in, in, in God, that God is good, or that God is all good, that there is uh, a life, that there is judgment, that, there, that, uh, that, that we are responsible, all of that, and taking that in, and, and applying love, doing, striving to do to others what you would have them do to you. That, and it's a struggle, of course, and it, it, we're imperfect in this. But God is perfect. God's grace is stronger than our failings. Remind people that there has to be something to remind them of. There has to be something there before. Uh, there. But so many people have forgotten this, the way they, as if what they had in CCD or in, in, in a Catholic school was just one other course. Like how much of the French that they had uh, for years in school do uh, of these people remember. They didn't use it. If you don't practice it, it dissipates. Il faut qu'on pratique une langue où elle est oubliée. You have to practice a language or she's lost. She's forgotten. So, elle est perdue. So, but um, we, uh, and, and even more so, 
in a quote unquote philosophy of life. And, and our religion is much more than that. It's a total way of life. It is not just you know, a set of moral precepts, which it is. It's not just a collection of rituals, which it is. But it's this total, this, it's this covenant with God. It's this centrality of God in every aspect of life. And we should not compartmentalize those aspects of life, but have them all united in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in the family of God the Father. Remind people of these things and charge them before God. So not just remind them, but tell them this is something you have to do. This is something you really need to believe if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ. This is the way of life you have to go. So uh, we're all uh, given a commission in baptism. And it's intensified in confirmation. And indeed, every time we receive Holy Communion, that's intensified. Jesus is saying to each one of us, come follow me. To stop disputing about words. So that uh, we the Christians can be a most contentious bunch. And look how divided we are about uh, things, uh, and especially about incidentals. You know, it's one thing to go your separate ways over uh, areas of, of conviction and areas of doctrine, especially major doctrines. So uh, it's one thing that, you know, that has to be. The church has to be one in doctrine, the Catholic Church. But we are in real, if impaired, communion with those uh, fellow Trinitarian Christians who uh, don't accept uh, so, uh, our, our, all of our doctrines, who don't accept even uh, major doctrines like the real presence of baptismal uh, regeneration or uh, original sin or, or free will or, or whatever. But we are all joined together and we need to cooperate with each other. And especially show love, and not just love within the household of the of the Christian faith, but love beyond that, the love to everybody, even love to people who hate us, even love to those who uh, think we're the the uh, weirdest uh, collection of people, or, or the uh, the most abject. Oh, that that. Uh, I mean, my aunt Evelyn was in hospital one time and she had she had a lot of ailments and heart problems uh she wasn't really related to me uh although she was irish so chances are there's some connection somewhere uh but she was a very close friend of my mother and, and a close friend to me and a mentor in so many ways and uh so she was in the intensive care one time and this doctor came in and she had a prayer book and a rosary there in the little tray next to that and he looked down or in, in these, uh, with uh, a lack of a bedside manner and said, well, I feel sorry for you that you're so uh, captured by these uh, uh, limitations and, and superstitions. And she looked at, at him and she said, oh no, I'm freed by this. And she picked a rosary up and she said, this is what's getting me through. And she didn't even like the rosary. This is what's getting me through prayer and, uh, and my relationship with Jesus Christ. So she put that down and she said to herself, I'm going to get better just to spite this guy. But uh, there it is. Do, so do we have to stand up for our faith, but, but we should explain it. And uh, we should ask the Lord for patience in this. Uh, as we're trying to do this, not to uh, give back as bad as we get. But if you have people who often will be get personal about this and just insulting, and uh, you know what people believe about, oh, you're an idol worshiper, you're uh, you're going to hell, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, our temptation is to say, 
oh, uh, after you and may you enjoy the trip, rather than you know responding that way to respond in prayer, to respond. In, but uh, so sometimes sarcasm is is really uh, useful uh, if done in a humorous way, and uh, and and uh, correcting these people and don't give up correcting them. There are some people like on the on the internet. Uh, they, don't bang your head against the wall unless it's made of foam rubber. So it's this. Some of these people, you just have to pray for them. But at least if you post something, maybe if it won't influence this person, maybe it will influence another person who's willing to find out what the truth of the Catholic Church is or the, the cr truth of your convictions are or what you really believe. And we should also defend people of other faiths too when their, their beliefs are, are slandered. Uh, in their stuff, uh, but also be honest in asking the questions or even stating what we see about this. You know, I can't see how uh, you can have a compatibility with God is love and then believe in this predeterminism and believe that God, uh, God hates Esau and loves Jacob or whatever. Yeah, I can't see how you can get that together, and I can't. Uh, I find it literally incredible and profoundly repulsive but uh, and not that the people I know who believe that aren't uh, fine people in spite of what of their, their concept of God that aspect anyway of the concept of God uh, and good Christians you know in the moral sense and, and in believing the basics the, like the Apostles Creed and the Nicene Creed and the like but back to this but to be contentious over everything. There are people who just like to fight, who, let's say, who'll get online to some, just to attack, and often to be vicious and, and just play nasty. And they enjoy that. And uh, you, uh, I think St. Paul had that impression about the, the Corinthian church. They just like to fight over everything. If they had uh, a coffee hour, there'd be people who'd be complaining, why don't we have tea? And if they had tea, they'd say, well, you really should have chamomile here as well and all this. And, and if you just have uh, jelly donuts, why don't you have uh, these other things or something? So always complaining about that. They, the people I call the, uh, the professionally annoyed. Uh, but there are some who are really like that, who really do delight in bringing division, in, in starting fights. So there are people, uh, you know, the, unfortunately we all have run across them, who like to start fights and then they pull back to watch and stuff like that, that they really enjoy that. These are uh, the spiritual descendants of people who attend gladiatorial games in, in Rome. But uh, we are not to be like that. Uh, but to fight over uh, a diaphora, things that may be uh, useful, but are not absolutely, uh, not really uh, needed. I was just saying the diversity of custom between different rites. So the, uh, the Greek rite, the Latin rite. Well, they were one church and there was all these, this variety of the modes where was one doctrine, different approaches, different spiritualities, different uh, cultural applications, different... Uh, prayers, different things. They, they have the same mass, the same divine liturgy, but it was very different in its externals. And if you didn't know the language, you would be completely lost. So if you were dropped in and one of them. So, um, and all and other customs, you know, the fasting customs were often different into different rites, uh, this, that. Uh, but instead of saying, vive les différences, long live the differences, all that this is uh, shows the diversity in in the garden of the Lord, the different flowers in the garden of the Lord, let a thousand blossoms bloom. Uh, but instead of that, often they they had to be total uniformity on everything, not just in doctrine, not just in the basic things, but the people wanted it, and it's my way or the highway. So that was it. So uh, they're they under the delusion that uh, the way they were doing the uh, worship was uh, the, the way Jesus did it at the Last Supper, the way, or the, way uh, the, the, the externals of their mass was the same as Jesus. Well, it wasn't. So it was like a Passover. 
You know, they were reclined the table and all this stuff. It was, it, it's very different. Uh, not that I don't like a, I think I would, I prefer a, you know, a solemn high uh, mass with the incense and Gregorian chant and Palestrina and the magnificent vestments in in this in a magnificent church, probably over uh, the externals that Jesus had. Although he, chances are there was chanting at the Last Supper, and Don Gregory Dix points out from his study of the Talmud about the Havarot, the uh, fellowship meals and various things, that they have incense at it. They had incense at it at that time. And uh, the spice box at the Sabbath, uh, common in, in the Jewish, the, is a leftover of the incense that was uh, of the custom of having incense at these things. But um, the, uh, there was great formality at it as well as informality uh, at the Last Supper. But, um, but they would fight over all this stuff, the language. It, uh, literally, the Latin and the Greek worlds couldn't speak to each other. The, the Latin was lost in the East and uh, Greek was lost in the West, just about. You get people like uh, 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 some, you know, Irish, some Irish monks might know some Greek or something in the dark age of that, or and even later, all that, people coming. Uh, there was contact, although much of it was uh, shattered by the uh, takeover by often uh, by Moorish and other pirates of the Mediterranean that uh, made a, a problem. Uh, alienation. The time on our more and more alienation and less and less tolerance of uh, the diversity of legitimate rights. And so fighting over everything. Should priests have beards? You know, it, 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 nasty fighting over that. Uh, how your taunts should be. And not even just between the Greek and the Latin West, but even within the Latin West. You know, the Celtic customs. The Celtic tonsure was from ear to ear, the front, and shaved in the front. Uh, but the the, the, Latin, the Italian tonsure was uh, shaving a big bald spot in the middle, and sometimes shaving everything except the little uh, sort of wreath of hair, which are like a crown of thorns sort of thing. Oh, oh fighting over everything. Married clergy in, in uh, the West and the East, also fighting over that. Uh, dates, dates of festivals, date of Easter, fight over that, fight over anything. Fight over your, your grandmother's turban. Uh, fight over every, anything. You know, uh, my way is the only way. And, and these are about incidental things, not, you know, major things. Uh, you know, it is the Eucharist valid if you use leavened bread? Is it valid if you use unleavened bread? Uh, does... Uh, you know, all fight, just fighting and fighting and fighting over this. This constant disputes over this, over uh, all sorts of other things, and often making it personal, uh, making it an ego uh, expression. So that's uh, not helpful. That's not defending the faith. That's not articulating the faith. And it's a scandal to people outside. I remember seeing a painting, an eighteenth-century painting, and it was. Uh, to uh, Christians disputing over something. Uh, and it, it was supposed to be in the, uh, the fourth century. Okay. And there's a pagan there who's like this. And he's sort of looking at, unsmiling, looking at them, uh, rolling his eyes at that. You know, how unattractive that they've made Christianity. Is that the, uh, the faith of God of love? Is that the manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit? Is that the proclamation of the incarnation and the saving death and resurrection of Christ? Is that the celebration of the communion of saints? No. So, and often people let their personalities take over. The worst aspects of their personalities take over. And project the worst aspects of their personalities on God very common. Uh, that's often the true idolatry there. Uh, one of the true idolatry, the true religious idolatry. There's plenty of uh, secular idolaters, or idolatries. Because idolatry is uh, pushing God aside and putting something else in the place. 
uh, even good things in the place of bad. Often it's bad things they put in the place of bad. And uh, uh, giving omnipotence to the state or to uh, an individual or to anything or to uh, a, uh, a craving uh, that's the very danger of idolatry. This serves... Stop disputing about words. This serves no useful purpose since it harms those who listen. The scandal of it. And then reproducing these quarrels off and the hatreds of that. Uh, Jesus complained about uh, some uh, zealots in his time who said, you go, you traverse the world to make converts and you make them twice as fit for hell as you yourselves. So, you know, look at Africa and these other places where uh, uh, people have imported the hatreds and uh, misunderstandings of uh, you know from the Reformation period or from all along and, and all of the the prejudices and all that uh, to uh, these people who had nothing to do with any of that stuff, but then they've reproduced that and and then the, the hatreds grow and all that. So you see this all over the place. So uh, or the counter Reformation also put that at the hatreds that came from that. Um, be eager to present yourself as acceptable to God. How are we acceptable to God if we're cooperating with grace? What's the evidence of our cooperating with grace? The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, hope, faith, fidelity, the, all that. Joy, Uh, kindness, gentleness, and uh, all of these things, all, all the virtues, the real virtues. Because we can, you know, clothe ourselves with the virtue, let's say, you know, that, you know, we're concerned about, we uh, abhor evil, but uh, we're a bitter, sour people. Is that going to attract people? No. Is that manifesting the Holy Spirit? No. You know, you can speak in tongues all your life or whatever like that, but if there's no, no manifestation of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, uh, that's just an illusion. And I'm not saying maybe that isn't a real gift that God gave you. The problem with spiritual gifts is that they can go to our heads rather than to our hearts and to our hands. And that we can uh, become very proud about this. You know, there's a danger, let's say, if you have, uh, if you had apparitions. Stuff like that. You could say, oh, I'm so chosen, I'm so worthy of this, I'm better than all these other people have. That doesn't necessarily go, that that's the case. But people like St. Bernadette uh, suffered this. They didn't want, you know, they were quite happy to have uh, the experience, the mystical experience of the Communion of Saints with the, you know, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, there. But uh, suffered the attention of it and all this other stuff and, and the persecution that came from that often and the jealousy and all this stuff so but others it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't come for that it's like having a uh, you know a, a steak knife but instead of cutting into the steak and eating the steak you end up stabbing yourself with it the it's a gift it's a tool but the tool, the tools of the gift of the spirit, are to be used for the fruits of the spirit. To to do for the development of of love, to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and to do to others as you would have to do to you. To live the commandments in love, to proclaim the truth in love, and that's a struggle. We're imperfect in that. We're imperfect in. You know, we have our temperaments, we have our brain chemistries that we have to deal with. But God's grace is there. As the Lord said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. To be acceptable to God, a workman who causes no disgrace. So uh, remember, he's addressing a bishop here, a missionary bishop, uh, a spiritual uh son of his uh, that uh, in this that uh, remember you're a workman 
Remember, you're a clay pot with the hands of the of the potter. That uh, a cracked pot maybe, but uh, of the pot that's supposed to hold the treasure. Uh, of the treasure of the gospel of God, the treasure of the grace of God, the treasure of the virtues of God, the treasure of the goodness of God, the treasure of the mercy of God, the a treasure of, of uh, the truth of God uh, there. But it's only going to come out if we're, it's, we're pursuing the right motives, of doing this out of love, out of service of God and service of others rather than to inflate our egos. Acceptable to God. So if I just have belief, I'm not acceptable to God. Even if it's perfect belief, even if I have the entire catechism memorized, if I have the entire new t uh, God, uh, Bible memorized and I know all the right footnotes, I know right all, all the in right interpretations, if I don't live them, if I don't strive to live them, uh, it's going to be perhaps even a slide down to hell rather than a stairway to heaven. It, it, it may be, uh, we may use our, our, this religiosity to alienate ourselves from Christ rather than to get closer, rather than living in grace. So, uh, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and it's easy if you know all this stuff to excuse yourself, to excuse your sins, and to excuse uh, socially acceptable sins, to go all along the stuff, along with that. So we do we see that happening now. People excusing abortion and even promoting abortion, excusing uh, the grossest forms of exploitation of other people and greed, uh, excusing uh, uh, the greatest lack of charity, excusing all the stuff, all, all sorts of, uh, you know, excusing sexual promiscuity, ex excusing this, that all these major sins that are truly damaging to people, and they excuse them, even though they know all this stuff. And, and they'll, they'll use scripture to try to do that. They'll use uh, theology to try to do this. They'll use philosophy to try to uh, get this across. And, and they'll try to convince themselves. And maybe they do truly delude themselves that this is the right thing. Uh, but again, we always have to remember it's God who does the judging, who does the passing of the sentence. Not you, not me. Not, we don't know the heart. We are not omniscient. You know, even well, there's a story of, uh, of, of, I forget who it was, that uh, Mary appears to somebody and... Uh, the person says, oh, oh, uh, I want you to be my judge and not your son. And she said, oh, no, you don't. She said, uh, he is the one who is all merciful. He is the one who is all knowing. So you cannot, he can, you cannot find uh, one more merciful than he, more understanding. More, uh, and he, being God, is omniscient. And I, not being God, am not omniscient. And uh, so... I will pray for you. So that's the story, the way the story goes. I forget who it was supposed to be to. But, uh, you know, Mary isn't holding back the hand of Christ. Christ is holding back his hand. Yes, the prayers help, the prayers of Our Lady especially. You know, and to her should be given all hypodulia, all honor as our mother, as, as, as the, the most chosen creature. But it's Christ who's God incarnate. It's God, Christ who's mercy incarnate. It's Christ who's uh, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life. Uh, so uh, pr the prayers of the body of Christ help, but it, it's, uh, it's not as if you know, we have to calm God down. Uh, and yes, you certainly have many illustrations of that in Scripture, especially in the Torah of, of, of God uh, losing it, and uh, Moses has to calm him down. Moses has greater mercy than God does portrayed in that. But that isn't true. God is all merciful. Now, I'm not doubting the inspiration of those texts, that they have to be interpreted rightly, and they have to be uh, applied rightly. God is love, Jesus is Lord. They have, for, as Christians, we have to apply them 
uh, in that those contexts. So and, and get to know God uh, as as God. In, uh, of course, we'll never completely know God. We can never know at all God's essence, but we can experience God's energies. We can experience God, experience him as love, experience him as truth, experience him as goodness, but also experience him as justice. Because justice and love go together. Justice and mercy go together. And uh, in our uh, warped view, our uh, original sin condition uh, viewpoint, they don't, but they in God, they absolutely do. So a workman who causes no disgrace. So a bishop, a priest, a deacon, an evangelist, a religious, a monastic, uh, anybody ministering in the body of Christ, lay ministers, lay this, uh, 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 CCD teachers, whatever. You're a workman. The Pope is a workman. Yes, he's the uh, temporal head of the church on earth during his, uh, uh, they used to call it reign. I don't know what they call it now here. During his, his time, uh, uh, there or that. But he's the, and yes, he's the universal pastor, uh, universal jurisdiction of all that, but he's just a workman. And the, the tool is, the, is God's grace. Uh, the gifts are from God and are to be used to be, uh, well, well, the fruit is it, the, the, the cause and the fruit uh, grace is. And the tools are the gifts that God gives us today. Natural gifts fortified by the supernatural, but especially the supernatural gifts in, in, in particular, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just a workman. As Jesus used that, he said, that you should say, you know, I'm, I'm an unprofitable servant. That's, that they, without God, absolutely nothing. It, literally, without God, uh, we wouldn't exist even. Without God's constant uh, attention, we wouldn't we wouldn't exist. And, and without God's gift, that without His grace, for it is by grace alone we're saved through faith that works through love. No salvation, no anything, no healing of uh, of spirit. So we're not to cause disgrace. To look around and look at the the workmen who didn't think they were workmen in the church. People often in high positions of responsibility, uh, who misuse that, and who I thought they were above everything. Uh, so the, you know, this, the example of that cardinal, and all the evidence seems to prove that all these accusations are very true of about his uh, his depravities and his predations. Uh, apparently, maybe even his uh, uh, helping himself to funds. I don't know about all this because I don't know about all this. And I, I really to pray. So I really pray that this is but not true, but it really looks like it is. Uh, doing that and no, don't tell me that this stuff wasn't really known by a lot of people, and, uh, and more than suspected by others. But uh, advancing him was helping their cause. Scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And yes, he was a, a, a gifted fundraiser, and he was apparently very charming, and all sorts of things. He seemed to have all sorts of qualifications, but uh, he was apparently just uh, a predator using this. He was a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And, and yeah, look at the, the pictures of him. He looks so... Uh, kind and gentle and and uh, caring, and you know what he was saying about all these things, even the, the things about uh, uh, the, in the sexual abuse crisis, how he was condemning all this. Well, apparently he was doing it himself. So there's that. But so what's the response? Oh, should we leave the church and start our own? Well, if you want, do what Voltaire said when someone uh, asked him if he should start his own church. He said, "Oh, certainly." Go and be crucified and then rise from the dead. Then you can start a church. Uh, 
that's the case. No, you don't leave the ark because of some of the passengers. I don't remember seeing a cartoon. It showed these two ducks on the ark, and, Mo, and, and uh, Noah, rather, is clinging to a, a post or something, and there's thunder and lightning and these colossal waves hitting against that, and, and winds, and all this hurricane winds, and these, and these two ducks have come up onto the uh, onto the uh, to the the deck, and uh, so uh, and they say to him uh, with great solemnity, "We do not like some of the passengers on this ark. We are leaving." So uh, you know the other apostles didn't say, "Well, uh, Judas was uh, one of these twelve here." And uh, Peter uh, certainly stumbled in, in uh, denying Christ and, and, and distress and all this and, uh, and all these other people are flawed people in that. Well, uh, let's just leave this Jesus thing and, and uh, start our own philosophy and, uh, and something like that. Uh, and uh, there's always the temptation. They didn't do that. There's always a temptation in the history of the church to uh, establish a church of the saints. So anyone with any flaws is out. So you have very, very strict standards and very low uh, forgiveness. Uh, uh, well, very high forgiveness standards, shall we say. So, uh, uh, so if people do something really bad, they're out and they can't come back. So, uh, so they break off from the church. So, yes, the church has to be constantly reformed, meaning the church people and their behaviors, uh, being that rather than the church per se. Uh, and yes, uh, theology all, needs always to be uh, advanced, but it has to be an advancement and not a uh, amputation of theology. The, and uh, a development, an organic development, uh, or, or an articulation in, in a new language to reach people that you can't, you're not reaching through the use of other language. Uh, but it has to be uh, the, the full white holy Catholic and apostolic Orthodox Christian faith that's really being presented, given over. Not... Uh, the uh, current uh, fad of uh, watering down everything. Uh, we can't do that. Nor should we go the other way, as, as uh, we're warned here about being contentious about every single word and all sorts of things. And everybody has to, you have to pray exactly the way I do. And you, and there can be no tolerance of any uh, diversity. I'm not talking about uh, violating the liturgy and saying, well, I can make up my own words and all this stuff and have clown masses and all that. Uh, no, I'm not talking about that. That's, uh, that's above, that's, that's disobedience as well as bad taste, but, uh, uh, about your, your own pr private prayer life, people's private prayer lives. And you have to pray this way. And this is the only way you can pray. That isn't the case. The prayer is so diverse and so rich. Uh, it's a relationship. A relationship takes in all sorts of modes in, in the way we relate to people, but especially in our relating to the infinite and the eternal. They would take in all sorts of, of ways. So not to cause disgrace, imparting the word of truth without deviation, true orthodoxy. Avoid profane, idle talk. So that's the, our culture is filled with obscenity and with uh, uh, degradation of holy sex. So we should, uh, the, the idle talk isn't just, you know, chewing the fat to chew the fat. That has its place, certainly. But this is uh, the stuff that uh, is the breeding ground of malicious gossip, of uh, all sorts of things like that. Uh, for such people will become more and more godless, which is true. Because you can, uh, you know, while you're 
adoring the projection of your own worst qualities, that you become more and more godless, and you will encourage good people to be totally repelled, and maybe to say, embrace atheism and all that. Uh, this uh, man I knew of, he was raised in a very religious household, but a loveless household. And uh, the concept of God was very, very harsh, very unforgiving, uh, very uh, uh, nitpicking, all of the, the stuff, and uh, uh, the threat of hell all the time, but uh, not really all that much of heaven, uh, except for the people who were exactly like the parents. Uh, that was just a different story. Well, he, when he was old enough, he just completely chucked that, and it it was uh, uh, he had nothing to do. He had nothing good to say about God. But I told him, I said, "Well, that's I, I'm very sorry that you that's been your experience, but that isn't God. That's not the Christian God. That's not God is taught in the Gospel of John, the first letter of John. Uh, that's uh, God. That's not God as I've experienced it. He just uh, gave a sort of." Uh, impatient and angry smirk like that and that was it so that was the end so uh that was that but you know your hope and i there was a woman i knew of who grew up in a particular sect uh that was uh, again it was hyper hyper tulipist five-pointer calvinist and it was uh it was some sort of you know, they they wouldn't have anything to do with Presbyterians. They wouldn't have anything to do with most Reformed Baptists, most, just about anybody. They were in this tiny group, and they were only supposed to uh, have fellowship with the tiny group, because all the others. And uh, she, uh, and they were very uh, uh, strict about all sorts, especially for girls. They had to wear long dresses. They couldn't cut their hair. They couldn't, uh, and she believed that she was predetermined to damnation because, you know, she wanted to put curlers in her hair. She wanted to go to the movies. She wanted to watch cartoons. She wanted, she wanted to have a television, all, all of this stuff. So that she thought, she was very bright but uh, as a, a little child, but she thought she was damned because she had all these uh, urges that were going on. And, and the churches, they were preaching, you know, this. You know, maybe even some of you here are not among the, the chosen or whatever. So, uh, most forms of Calvinism encourage education, but this one didn't. And so uh, she ended up, she was very bright. She took a scholarship. She uh, Her parents had nothing to do with her after that. She got married uh, to someone later who was a lapsed Catholic. Uh, and she, uh, uh, all, she became an atheist, and he was an atheist, too. It had nothing to do with it. And she said one time, she goes, just the, the word God, the word Christ, the name Jesus, said they just give me uh, shivers of horror. That was her, the experience that was given to her of God. This idol that would, had usurped the throne of God. This false, uh, hateful concept of God that uh, made a loveless case for that. So this first case, the person was, they were in some, so far, the, the, uh, the second case, the first case I gave, that person was from a Catholic background that, that, that uh, had, had really undone, uh, there was no love in it. And so, you know, even truth with capital T, so you have the full truth, it's not a truth with a capital T if there's no love. So, go on. The word of truth without deviation. Avoid profane, idle talk, for such people will become more and more godless. And their teaching will spread like gangrene. So that's, so this, so uh, the teaching of immorality, that seems to be the context with their uh, profane and idle talk. Um, uh, more as it's, uh, condoned, will do it, it'll destroy. That's what gangrene does. Uh, destroy the, the limbs. In fact, uh, this uh, image was used often for excommunication, they say, 
there has to be a surgical removal of this limb uh, lest it spread the, for the, having that. So among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have deviated from the truth by saying that the resurrection has already taken place. So, which is quote unquote a spiritual thing. So, uh, the central miracle of the resurrection is the uh, its bodiliness. Jesus rose bodily from the dead, and not just spiritual. Whatever spiritual resurrection it is, but that you know, you that is a uh, an analogy to a physical resurrection. You know that you know you're spiritually dead, but of course your soul is immortal. So that. But it, it means you're de devoid of, of the virtues. You're devoid of uh, spiritual experience and the, and the like. Uh, but that, it really isn't literally resurrection. The, the bodily resurrection of Christ was resurrection. And that's what's going to happen to us on the last day. We're going to be bodily resurrected. But uh, that was considered totally laughable the zeb in uh, among the uh, uh, in the greco-roman world so yeah it's immor immortality maybe uh transmigration of souls uh, reincarnation or something like that maybe something something uh, uh you know you, you go to Go to Hades, go to the realm of the dead, or maybe you can go to the Elysian fields or whatever after death, or you get recycled. Uh, there were different things of that. But resurrection, that just seemed ridiculous. The Pharisees, the Sadducees also sort of had that attitude towards bodily resurrection. Uh, because, you know, if you don't really believe in miracles, then the, the body of resurrection is absurd as is the incarnation uh you really can't be a christian if you don't believe in miracles now there are some groups that say oh there were miracles at the beginning but then they stopped well no there are still miracles going on uh, there are all sorts of attestations to them that with you know agnostic physicians examining people and say there's absolutely no ex explanation of this you should have been dead long ago how this happened there's no way but because they will say we don't, can't explain it. I had a friend who was a uh, who was an atheist, and uh, but not you know one of these five A atheists, uh, antagonistic, arrogant, uh, uh, aggressive, uh, anti-theist atheist. He wasn't one of those. He was sort of mellow. He was said you know believe what you want, and and, and even said well I've sort of uh, you know, wish I could have this belief, but you know, I also wish I believed in, uh, you know, in Santa Claus and, and the Tooth Fairy or something like that. He was like that, and uh, he said he had no problem exposing his children to this, and if they got some comfort out of it or something like that, as long as it wasn't just a delusion, uh, that was fine with him. But uh, which actually they didn't do. Uh, his uh, he, he had married a lapsed Catholic who wasn't interested either in all this, but uh, I was talking about something and he said uh, about miracles and he said, I have faith that we will find a natural explanation to all this. And I said, you have what? And he smiled because he had faith because it was, there was no, he didn't have any proof. He didn't, let, he didn't have any evidence, let alone proof for this. It was, uh, it was, a sort of blind faith even in that. A blind faith in quote unquote scientism and material. The, the material is all there is. You know, if this exists because I can analyze it. You know, I can uh, break it up. I can find out what the chemical the, the makeup of it is. But love and uh, all this other stuff, that's, it's just a chemical reaction in the end. And all that, and, and there's no God, there's no afterlife, there's no objective right or wrong. Although he was very moral person, and very, very, very upright person. Uh, but I was saying, I said, well, aren't you sort of going on the fumes of, of uh, 
object, uh, belief of objective right and wrong and all this. So again, he smiled at it. As I said, he wasn't one of these aggressive people. If he were one of those multiple A atheists, I, you know, after a five-minute conversation, that would have been it. Probably it's just what I do. Anyway, prayer is really helpful. Loving people, that's it. That's the only thing that you can do. Be uh, as uh, loving as you can. At, uh, was it Ovid who said, if thou wouldst be loved, be lovable. I don't think he was talking about uh, agape love in that case, but that is the case with us. If we want to be loved, then we should be manifesting qualities that uh, draw love to that, the, the fruits of the Spirit. So anyway, these two, Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, denied this, you know, the bodily resurrection. And they said the resurrection has already happened. So it's, it's this total interior experience. So this is a sort of proto-Gnostic approach to something. It has already taken place, and they are upsetting the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands, bearing this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord avoid evil. So that's it. So it's not a, just to call upon the Lord's name. Avoid evil, and avoid the occasion of sin. You're falling into sin? Well, are you wallowing in occasions of sin? Are you, you know, that... Uh, so, you know, it's, that's something to expect, basically. In a large household, there are vessels, not only of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for lofty and others for humble use. If anyone cleanses himself of these things, he will be a vessel for lofty use, dedicated, beneficial to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So this image, uh, you know, like the, the, the image of the... Uh, that uh, St. Paul has the, uh, elsewhere of the, we are uh, clay vessels that, that containing a treasure. Uh, here, he's talking about the, the vessel itself. So some are really, you know, so you get a vase, as someone said, uh, the difference between a vase and a vase is the price. And uh, so you have uh, both made out of, the, of clay, all that, but one is beautiful, one is uh, cost a fortune, the other thing is just a flower pot, a clay flower pot, not decorated, not anything, just there. Uh, but they both have their uses. So it's a bit, he's calling us that we should be uh, a, a vessel of silver and gold before the Lord. But he says, but there are also wood and clay, some for lofty and other for humble use. And, uh, you know, that uh, we should have the humility of seeing a, a, as a humble use, as an exalted use for God, as, as long as the will of God is done. He said, ready for every good work, that should be our, our way. So turn from youthful desires, from a spiritual immaturity and cravings that, fit, that you, you, can't, you can't control your cravings like a two-year-old. Uh, no, but uh, pursue righteousness. Well, actually, two years old. Well, they can do pretty well about that, uh, but uh, if they're willing. Pursue righteousness, that is goodness, holiness, the very uh, love that God is. Faith, love, the sadafe love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord with purity of heart. So it's not just enough to call him love, but to do so with purity of heart, with the right motives. Avoid foolish and ignorant debates. For you know that they breed quarrels. So, you know, try to say that, you know, on the internet, if it's just, well, one of the good things on the internet, you can just push the button and end it, end it. So there, but before you send this thing, you know, say, well, is there love in this? Is this, uh, Am I just getting back at this person who's uh, ridiculing me, ridiculing my faith, ridiculing my whatever? Or am I really trying to you know, portray the good or expose the evil? So he said, a slave of the Lord, a servant of the Lord, because really we're not slaves. We're sons and daughters. 
should not quarrel, but should be gentle with everyone, able to teach, tolerant. This doesn't mean tolerating evil. It means, you know, having that approach uh, to others. Correcting opponents with kindness. So he doesn't say don't correct, but he says do it with kindness. It may be that God will grant the repentance that leads to knowledge of the truth and that they may return to their senses out of the devil's snare, where they are entrapped by him for his will. And, and here, of course, the context is even about uh, immorality in general. In that. So let's look at the commentary in the Ignatius Study Bible. Remember Jesus. So that's 2 8. I went 2 6. 2 14. 2 13. Yeah, 2 11 through 13. Possibly, no, no, that's not it. Yeah. Here it is. 2 14. Avoid disputing. Timothy must silence errant teachers who are fascinated with useless speculation and become contentious when it comes to defending their private opinions before others. See 1 Timothy 1, 3-7. This is a matter of urgency, since their novelties are already spreading like an infectious disease. The word of truth, the gospel message, which is heard through preaching, uppermost in Paul's mind is the word of God orally proclaimed. Not the word of God written in the scriptures, Romans 15-4. Though the latter is often central to Christian teaching and evangelism. Hymenaeus, possibly the same person Paul had already excommunicated for blasphemy in 1 Timothy 1.20. His partner Philetus is otherwise unknown. The resurrection is past. The precise nature of this error is unclear. Perhaps false teachers affirmed, quote unquote, a spiritual resurrection in connection with baptism but denied the Pauline doctrine of bodily resurrection of the whole person in the future. According to some, the denial smacks of early Gnosticism, an ancient heresy that reached its full development in the second and third centuries and was known to repudiate the body and material world in general. And so let's look at the, The Jerome Biblical, the quote unquote old Jerome Biblical. The polemical section, false teachers. 2, 14 through 26. We're not we're only going to get up to 118. Um, verses 14, 16, and 23 repeat descriptions of the false teachings found in 1 Timothy 1, 4, 6. That's the uh, denial of the resurrection there. And uh, the, uh, a complete, quote unquote, spiritualization of everything. So uh, with the, uh, uh, the alien, the material, material is evil, the spiritual is good, the truly spiritual is good, but all material is good. No, the material was created by God, so it's good. Yes, it, there's a flaws. We have a lot of flaws to original sin and to all sorts of other stuff. So and we're not in full communion with our materiality. But uh, it will be in the resurrection. So the, the false teachings, this proto-Gnosticism, which may be there. The faithful dispenser of the word of the truth. The Greek term for faithful dispenser occurs only here in the New Testament. Well, the concept... Uh, is uh, look back to uh, the first chapter of the 14th verse. Hymenaeus, 1 Timothy 1.20. Philetus, these men hold that the resurrection of Christians has already taken place. They deny the future bodily resurrection and glorification and restrict resurrection to the mystical form of this experience in baptism. But at least they have, uh, baptism means something, unlike some heresies, which is just some outer sign of, of uh, personal commitment. Uh, but uh, 
no, the baptism now saves you, as, as St. Peter teaches. At least they get that, if that's, uh, if they get that. Because it's vague, we don't really know what the, the full heresy is here. This idea of a purely spiritual resurrection is in keeping with the erroneous teachings described in 1 Timothy 4-5. through The firm foundation of God is the church. See 1 Timothy 1, 3.15. In the first motto, motto taken from Numbers 16.5, no has the biblical meaning of love and favor. So we'll stop there because we're at 10 past 3. So let's pray the Our Father for all of our needs, especially that we really grow in the fruit of the Spirit and are zealous in uh, defending the faith, but are kind in doing this and try to do it with patience and uh, real knowledge and, and charity. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There we are. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If we don't, if you're not here for the uh, spiritual book club tomorrow, or the masses and the other things that we have. And I will be having, on Thanksgiving, I won't have the... Uh, you cat class. I'll have a Thanksgiving service at two. Well, actually, it won't be at two. I'm going to have it at four, because people will be eating at two. So I'll I'll move it to four. Okay. So have a wonderful day. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Patricia Kelleher, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. John O'Driscoll, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Priscilla Lyra Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Have a wonderful day now. Bye now.